Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. I'm excited to be here with my friend, Mike Warner. And we were just saying, like, got to get on a podcast interview to catch up because we've been meaning to catch up for a while. And sometimes you just need to have something on your calendar to catch up with each other. So what I'm excited about catching up with him about is about his new book. So he has a book called Work Hard, Playlist Hard that's been out for a while. I recommend it to all my students. And he is coming out with the new edition. So I'm excited to talk to him about that. Before we get into that, Mike, I would just love for you to tell them a little bit about your background in music and in the industry and with streaming and all of that. Yeah, sure. And thank you, Bree. I'm really happy we got to catch up and on the record, as we were saying before (laughs) we press the record button. uh, So anything could happen here. But yeah, yeah. let me think of the shortest version possible. I always tell this a different way and it gets very long winded, but uh, the old cliche music lover from a young age, I never picked up an instrument, could never play an instrument to save my life, loved music, ended up getting into DJing as soon as I was legally allowed to enter a nightclub in Australia. And After a few years of playing most venues in my hometown, I got into music production so I could start performing outside of my hometown. And fast forwarding from that, I've worked in multiple projects. I've hosted podcasts. I hosted a local radio show. And I went down the independent route with my music project, Date Night. And when that happened, we released our debut album. We distributed our music independently. We did all of the work, made all of the mistakes, had some wins. The process was documented and it ended up becoming part of the book Work Hard, Playlist Hard, which is part of the reason why we're here today. Actually, that was a pretty quick summary. That was very fast. I am impressed. Now, when did the first version of the book come out? The first version, you know what? I'm going to cheat. Let me take a look here. <laughs> Let me pull out a copy of the book. I know I've got my books back here in case I ever forget the, uh, the release date. <laughs> no, so the originally it came out in 2018 and it was just a PDF document online. But when I got serious and I put it in print, in paperback, hardcover, all of that, it was 2019. So, wow, it's over two years old. Wow. Yeah. And I think I had you on my summit in 2019. And I do do think I remember when it was not even in book form. So that's cool. Um, So I would love to like the biggest thing that I want to know is why a second edition? Why did you feel like you needed to? And I know things in the music industry change all the time, right? But it seems like a lot of things have really changed in the streaming world. And why did you feel like now was a good time to, to update the book. So it's an interesting one. It's not like I sat down one day and went, I'm going to write a second edition and I'll be done in a week. I've been writing this ever since the first edition came out. I've just been updating things over time. I'll get feedback from someone. Someone will ask me a question that wasn't in the book. So I've just been building and building and building it. And to be honest, it got to the point where a good friend of mine just said, it's never going to be done. You just need to set a date and say, on this date, it's coming out as current and up to date as it can be. And that's it. Otherwise, you're going to just keep updating, keep adding to this. It's going to be this beast, but no one will ever get to see it. Kind of like music. You know, someone works on a song for a year or more and they're never at the point where they feel it's ready to be released. But 
it probably was six months earlier and yeah. people were just waiting to hear it. Writing and rewriting or mixing and mixing again. Yeah, totally. It's, yeah. Your friend is very smart because you do have to finally just be like, okay, I'm doing this and I'm setting a deadline. So, but that's, that's cool that you're, you were basing it on questions you were getting from the book or things that needed to be updated. What do you think is the biggest thing that has changed in the streaming world between 2018 and now? <laughs> yeah, this is going to sound really strange given the title of the book, but the world of playlists has become very, very saturated. Now, that doesn't always necessarily mean that it's bad, but it does mean that back when I wrote the book originally, there were less playlists, but there were less people trying to get on them. Now, <laughs> playlists is really the buzzword, and it's how can I get on playlists? Where are the playlists? And and people talk about playlists more than anything else. Um, so, you know, I've sort of tried to reset it a little when I have conversations with artists and say, look, yes, you, playlists are great. You will get on them eventually, but that can't be your plan. There's, there's a bunch of other things that you can do with your music. And so I guess for me what's changed is the way that people are sharing music, that they're talking about it, that they're connecting with their audience, whether it's live streaming on Twitch, whether it's posting short clips on TikTok, there's all of these things that may not have existed when the first book was out or they've gotten a lot bigger during this time. And it's not just COVID and the fact that a lot of people have been spending more time at home. Uh, even before that, TikTok was taking off like crazy. And, yeah, it's, it's just been interesting because one thing that I've noticed, and I don't mention COVID really more than maybe once in the book um, because I feel that everything that has happened during this time was already happening in some way. Uh, we were already using these new apps. We were already communicating in these different ways. We were already using all of these new tools that were created. Um, so, yeah, I guess for me it, it was hard to just – try to help people with where to focus their time and energy now without overwhelming them. Um, you know, and not everyone will be comfortable with the same platforms. Not everyone is comfortable live streaming on camera four hours a day and connecting directly with their fans. Not everyone is comfortable uh, trying to create videos to share their new release. Um, and you know, I guess for me, I just wanted to find well, what are you comfortable with? What is the best way that you connect with your audience and you find that audience that maybe you haven't connected with previously? And, yeah, I feel like I just went on a big kind of... <laughs> you need to stop me sometimes. No, no, that's really good because I, I, I have looked at the book and... <laughs> my thoughts were, oh my Lord, there are so many tools here that I didn't even know about mm. that will help musicians that like literally platforms I've never heard of. You know, there's obviously the, the, you know, the TikToks and the Twitches and things that I've heard of that I haven't delved deep into myself. Um, I even have to admit like one day you were doing something on Twitch and I got a notification. I'm like, I'm going to go watch this. I've never been on Twitch. And then I like downloaded the app and apparently I had already created an account, but I didn't remember my password. And I'm like, <laughs> all right, I can't get to this because I don't know my password. And so I was a little frustrated um, because there's just so many platforms, right? And people are showing up in different places. And I was kind of like, well, if I can't watch Mike on Twitch, I guess I'll go watch him somewhere else later. Um, but there's plenty of people that are always hanging out on Twitch that are going to watch you. So I guess my biggest question from looking at the book is how can someone go in and read that book and get, you get all those resources and not get so overwhelmed or think they have to be in all of those places? Like, how do you recommend they get started doing something in there um, and not always feeling that FOMO of like, oh, I should be doing Twitch and I should be doing this and I should be doing that. Um, just like we usually do with like, I should be on YouTube and I should be on Facebook and it, you know, yeah. it starts, it starts to get like, so 
overwhelming, I think, to artists and even just general business owners that it just makes you feel like you want to give up because you know you can't be everywhere, but you feel like you should be. So how can they figure out like where is the best place for them to start and then start adding these other ones? Yeah, definitely. And uh, I just want to say straight up, there is no expectation that an artist is going to be heavily active on multiple platforms, especially if we're talking social media. You know, I mean, you may set up an account on all of the major social media apps and you may check in there time to time, but there's most likely going to be one where you go, this is more me. I'm more comfortable. You know, Instagram is great because I like to post pictures and I like to tell a story in the caption or YouTube is great because I'd rather just turn the camera on and do almost a vlog and share my process with people. You're going to find one that works best for you. And that's where you will put in more of your energy. Uh, outside of that, and I know you mentioned with the, how overwhelming it is in the book. Uh, what I, I'm talking about in the book is there are multiple platforms where people can find your music and listen. I mean, obviously we know Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, the main, some, of, some of the biggest ones, some of the most common and most well-known ones. Um, outside of that, there are platforms in other countries that are just as successful, if not have more subscribers and more listeners. So you've got GeoSaven in India, you've got Angami in the Middle East, you've got Deezer, which is in a lot of countries right now, but is really big in France. Um, all of these platforms, artists don't need to create an account, subscribe and listen. They just need to know that they exist and they need to have a presence on there. So when I say that there will be some work, I'm talking get access, claim your artist profile, add some information on there, and then you may not touch it again for a while. Um, it's not, the book is not intending to give you ongoing work and <laughs> make being an artist a full-time job, which for most it already is. Um, but it is saying, hey, here's some things that you can do. It's going to take a little bit of your time, but here are the benefits from doing that. Plus, if somebody is listening to your music in India and they don't listen on Spotify and they listen on GeoSave and you have a profile, you have a way of welcoming them when they first discover your music, they have ways of connecting with you because they can find your social media easier um, and you can do creative things such as uh, I believe they're called shorties right now it's current <laughs> wow they need uh, to fix that. <laughs> and shorties are short form videos similar to Spotify have a canvas um, so you've got you've got all of these cool little things that you can do that you may have already created for one platform and you could just simply go and upload it there as well. You know, nobody is saying, hey, go and do an exclusive photo shoot and upload it for Angami or Deezer. The, we're basically saying what you already have, those photos, that bio, the social media links, um, maybe some short videos. You can just go and take that and upload it to all of these platforms directly and have a home on them. So if people find you, uh, they can continue to stay in contact with you and find out a little more about you. Um, whenever I discover an artist, the first thing that I do is I click to their profile and I want to find out more about them. I want to, I want to find out, where are they based? What have they done before? Who have they collaborated with? Um, and then I will click onto their social media and I will see their posts and I'll give them a follow because I like their music. I'd like to know more about them as a person as well and connect with them on that level. So that was, that was the reason for sort of going into it. Um, you know, letting artists know social media is definitely important. I, I am not someone that's going to tell you all the things that you should do on social media because it's different for each artist. But I will say that there should be one platform that you should focus your energy on and it should be a platform that complements you um, and you feel that it's worth spending the most time contributing to. So once again, photos, Instagram, video, YouTube, live streaming, having a conversation, Twitch. Um, yeah. Yep. Shorts, TikTok, Instagram reels, that kind of thing. Um, I, I'm just thinking based upon all these 
opportunities that you're giving them in the book to expand their reach onto different platforms that they're probably not using, it seems like one way to go about this would be to get all your stuff together for your top platform now, say that's Spotify, and you get everything you need. Like you said, stuff for Canvas, you get your bio all in order, you get whatever pictures you want to use, decide which things you want to highlight, all of that. You do it on one platform. And then I'm all about outsourcing. You bring somebody in to help you, you know, a college student that needs some extra money or something. And you say, okay, here, I don't, I already have everything in this folder that I put on, on Spotify, use this book, go, you know, claim all my artist accounts on all these other places and update all this stuff. Cause it's not different, right? Your, your, your bio doesn't change your, your social medias don't change all of that stuff. And at least then you'll have a presence on those other places. Do you think that makes sense to do it that way? Absolutely. If you don't have the time and you see the value in this, then absolutely spend a little money and have someone else do it. You, you, you really, you hit it on the head right there. The bio is done. The photos are done. They don't need to create anything. Uh, they just need to simply upload it and make sure it's there and help you to get that presence. So you could definitely outsource. Yeah. And I, I just, I think, I was just amazed at how many other platforms that there are out there. And I know that a lot of them have tools for artists beyond just like here, put your bio up here, here's some picture spots, all that. Do you wanna talk about some of those? I know Pandora has like special tools for artists. And I remember hearing about some cool, you can do like voice messages to your fans and cool stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Pandora alone, for anyone that's outside of the US, Pandora is only available in the US at this time. It has been in other, available in other countries previously, but anyone anywhere in the world can claim their presence on Pandora and record, as you mentioned, voice messages that will play before or after your song that could be promoting almost anything you would like. Like uh, having your own be... commercials. That's so cool. Yeah. I've, there's artists that will say, hey, I, I'm doing a live stream next week on this platform. That's not Pandora. Here's a link. Uh, you tap the button on your screen right now and we'll take you directly to that. They can sell tickets to a concert. They can sell merchandise. They could take you to their own playlist they created on Pandora or another song. Um, you know, they're really relaxed with it and it doesn't cost you anything. If somebody is about to listen to your song or they just listened, that message will play. Um, you know, and it's free. Most importantly, you are not paying to do this. And you mentioned it can be like an ad for yourself. Yep. And I know in my Rock Your Next Release course, I do recommend they set up their Spotify for artists. I recommend and they set up their AMP account for artists on Pandora. What are some of the other ones you think you would you would prioritize out of all the other options? Yeah, definitely. I know I'm going to leave some out here, but as far as ones that I've had conversations about recently, Amazon Music. So Amazon Music for artists, it's only been available for just over a year. And they also, Amazon also own Twitch, which not everyone knows. And so there's some really cool integrations you can do between the two. Uh, so you mentioned when I went live on Twitch, um, one thing that can happen is an artist can go live on Twitch and someone may have never touched Twitch before, never logged in, but they're following that artist on Amazon Music. It will also go live within Amazon Music at the same time. And so all followers of that artist will get a notification saying, this artist is live right now. Would you like to watch? And they can actually watch it directly on that artist's profile within Amazon Music without even needing to go into Twitch. Um, and Amazon will showcase artists while they're live within the Amazon Music app as well. And it's a simple link that you click to connect the two. That's very cool. I didn't know about that. Yeah. So, you know, I, I say to artists, I say... You may not have any followers on Twitch, but if people are following you you on Amazon Music, connect the two, click the link, and the next time you go live, they'll get notified. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so what other ones would you then prioritize next? Yeah. So just one more thing with Amazon as well is they have an integration with merch. Um, so when you're live streaming, 
or on your artist profile. So on Twitch, it would show at the bottom of your stream and you could say, hey, the T-shirt I'm wearing right now, if you would like to buy it, you can click the button below and you can buy it directly. Or if they go to the artist profile in Amazon Music, all of the uh, merch will be there as well. And of course, being Amazon, you're already logged in with your Amazon account. You click a button, you buy it. It arrives on your doorstep before you can walk to the front door. It's it's scary, but it's cool. Um, but yeah, that's, that's enough about Amazon. Let's move on to the other ones as well. So uh, Apple Music for artists, they've really started to step it up this year. I've noticed it seems like they're they're putting a very heavy focus on building out their artist tools. So Apple music for artists, as it is currently, they will show you what playlists you've been added to stream counts, how many listeners you have. There's actually a really cool interactive map where you can zoom in to cities, counties, depending on what you're looking at around the world, suburbs, et cetera. And you can see how many people are listening in that exact location um, how many streams and of which songs. So let's say you were playing in a small venue, you know, a, a small venue with 100, 200 people max, and you want to see, okay, what is the song that is most listened to in this specific location? You can find that out. And then, of course, when you're performing, if the crowd aren't really getting into it yet, why not play the song that's the most popular there so they recognize it, get their attention? Um, and on the flip side, if, if you've got a crowd and you're, you're rocking it and save that till last, make that your encore. I've seen artists use it for that exact reason. Uh, and the same with trying to land some radio programming. Say, look, we got 4,000 people in this location have listened to this song in the last month. Mm. We think it's worth giving it a shot on radio as well. Wow, that's crazy analytics. Amazing. Yeah. It's it's mind blowing, you know. People would say it's scary, but it's not like it's telling you the person's right. name, date of birth, email address, or anything. It's just saying there is a person that pays for Apple Music because there's no such thing as free accounts that is paying for their subscription and is listening to your music in this location, which is really cool. Um, and outside of that, Apple Music let Apple also have Shazam, of course. So some people don't know, but even before Apple acquired Shazam, they were still using the Shazam technology. So anytime someone would say, hey, name of person in my phone, whose name I won't say right now, (laughs) we'll call them S. Hey, S, what song is this? And it would say listening and it would return the result. That was actually coming from Shazam even before, even before Shazam was acquired by Apple. So people didn't have to download the app, create an account, And they were contributing to the number of Shazams, which was contributing to the charts, which uh, with some radio stations around the world, they actually have the Shazam top 50 and things like that. Uh, One one really cool personal story about Shazam. And um, this was before it was acquired by Apple Music. So there was a separate website called Shazam for Artists. And um, went in there one day and realized that there was a nice number of Shazams on a specific song in Japan and dug a little deeper and then realized, okay, there is a background music service called mood media and they program music for retail stores, restaurants, hotels all around the world. Uh, Did a little research and asked them some, some of the stores that they've programmed our music in. And then we looked at the map and we realized, okay, this was actually in the Nike store in Japan, uh, which is a multi-level store. And surely enough, it was maybe six weeks later, someone we collaborated with on that song sent me a video and he goes, you wouldn't believe this. I'm in the Nike store in Japan. And you know that song where I recorded bass guitar for you guys? Uh, It's playing right now. And um, we actually got to find out as a result of Shazam and then a little extra research and then surely enough, someone recognizing it when they were in the store as well. That is so cool. I mean, it is amazing to hear your song or someone that you know in a store like that. Yeah. And the fact that people were trying to figure out what that song was, that just proves that that song has traction. I feel like it's almost the biggest compliment because nine times out of 10, it's going to be, 
I know this song, but I want to remind myself for later, or I like this and I want to put it in my playlist when I get home. Um, yes, there may be the occasional, this is, I don't know what this is, but I don't want to hear it again. What is this? But <laughs> for the most part, I would take it as a positive. And I forget that that's even a thing. I like, I forget yeah. that I could do that because I was in the bank the other day and I was like, what is this song? I know this song, but I can't figure it out. You know, and I came home and I'm like typing the lyrics into Google, like so old school when I could have just done that. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, it's always awkward to explain, especially on a podcast setup, because I know if I say it, my phone's going to go crazy. I know. Uh, the nice lady that whose name begins with S is also in the computer and everywhere else. So, that's yeah, it. you know, I had to disconnect Alexa before we started. So yeah, well, no, I have one over there, but I think it's uh, it's not hooked up yet because we got the new versions. Oh, yeah. And I definitely, I remember during the um, interviews for the summit, I had that happen one time where I was talking about, I was talking about how you can use Spotify with Alexa. And I like said something and of course it went off and we, we both started cracking up, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just the world we live in now. Actually, that, that's a good point. Um, one thing I encourage everyone to do, whether you have a podcast or whether you have music or both. Um, you know, in, a lot of people say, oh, hey, if you have an Amazon account, go and type in my name, search for me and click follow or go and click this link and make sure you follow. But really all they need to do is say, hey, the next time you're near your Amazon device, say, Alexa, follow artist name on Amazon Music or mm. Alexa, follow artist name and it's as simple as that. And they're now following you. And oh, wow. I found a lot more people just by simply saying that they want to try it. You know, it's, it's, it's way more fun than clicking a link and staring at their screen. Um, if they've got a voice assistant in their, in their headphones while they're out for a walk, they can actually verbalize that and say, follow this artist. And, um, you know, I feel like as we move forward, people are spending less time staring at their screens while they listen to music. So it just makes sense to say, look, here's a verbal command that you can say so that you don't miss any of my music moving forward or you get reminded every time there's a new episode of the podcast. That's awesome. I just learned something new because I listen to music in the kitchen all the time when I'm cooking. And if I'm listening to a playlist and I'm always having to be like, walk over there and see who the name of the artist is. And, you know, I should just think, oh, who's this, you know, ask her, who's this artist? And then be like, follow. I didn't even know you could do that. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, if it's Apple, it's, hey, S, what song is this? And they'll tell you. And they, or, hey, S, add this song to my playlist or add this song to my library. As, it's as easy as that. Um yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with your voice nowadays. Yep. And I, I think a lot of it for artists needs to be around educating fans about this. I was just thinking, you know, you could make a really fun video about how you follow people using Alexa, you know, by doing a video of you following yourself or whatever. Um, yeah. You know, they just they need direction because they don't know. And it's not that they a lot of artists are like, well, nobody follows me on Spotify. I'm like, did you tell them how to do it? Like, did you give yeah. them a little video that shows them how, what to click and all that? Because that's that's where the barrier happens. Yeah. You know, and Spotify is a fun one because, um, well, Apple have this as well, uh, but QR codes, um, you know, we've seen all kinds of fun with that recently. I, I think there was one and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it may have been in Hong Kong and it was over the city and it was a few hundred drones that were flying and they created the QR code that was shown above the city. And of course, everyone stopped, looked up. And what, what's the first thing you do when you see something like that, you pull out your phone to take a picture. And of course the camera would immediately scan the QR code and then they would tap the link. And now you've got their attention. Um, I'm not, now I'm not saying every artist can afford an army of drones to fly around in the sky, but those QR codes, you can have that on your phone. So if you're talking to someone, you can go, you know, and they go, Oh, where can I find your music? You can go, you know what? Open up the camera on your phone, point it at this. Mm. And then they go, Oh, perfect. Done. Uh, I've seen people print them on flyers. I've seen people 
put them on their on their website. I've seen people post them in stories. Um, you know, however you want to do it, but it's a much more fun way to follow someone, and it's a lot quicker. And younger people are used to it. I mean, my kids are used to QR codes at school. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a barcode, but it's just, it's newer, so it's cool. <laughs> you know, eventually someone will say, no, nah, QR codes, that is so 2020. Come on. Uh-huh. Catch up. Funny. But yeah, they'll, have, they'll have some other thing you know, yeah. that we don't know about yet. But, okay, so I know that the focus of this book is really more expanding beyond playlists and opening artists minds to all the other ways that they can get people connected with them and that you know more people can hear their music but let's actually talk about playlists what has changed with playlists since your first book and you know what are your recommendations with artists and playlists have they changed since then yeah so when i when i wrote the first edition there was a small number of types of playlists um it was very it was very much editorial which people that work at the streaming platform sit down and their job is to curate music and uh, listen to music and put it in those playlists and then there was third party or independent which is anyone that has a subscription with that streaming platform creates a playlist themselves and shares it publicly so that anyone can go and listen to that playlist obviously some people would do that and get thousands if not millions of people following their playlists um but since then we've started to see all kinds of different playlists in addition such as personalized editorial playlists or or some people if they want to be more technical they call them algo playlists as well short for algorithm um but Personalized editorial playlists, if we're talking about Spotify, uh, they're playlists that will still have a public follow account. They will be, they will show as created by Spotify. So, um, but what happens is the playlist will serve a completely different set of music based on the listener. So, for anyone that's playing along right now, if you were to go into Spotify and look at a playlist called Weekend Hangouts, it looks like an editorial playlist. You can follow it. I can follow it. But if we opened up our phones at the same time and looked at the playlist, we'd have completely different music in there. Um, and so the way that it works is Spotify will have a pool, if you will, like a swimming pool of up to roughly 600 songs that work within that playlist. Uh, obviously, it's not genre-based, it's it's mood. So it can be a mix of dance music, country music, pop, hip-hop, rock, whatever. And then what it does is it takes those songs and it looks at what you listen to and your listening habits, who you follow, and it serves 100 songs that it feels would be best suited for you from that list for a weekend listening session. Mm. And um, it's a real, it's really cool because I've, so with my music project, we were added to weekend hangouts. We're still in there for obviously some people and the amount of listeners that we've received from that is far higher than larger editorial playlists that aren't personalized. So what that says to me is that, okay, not everyone is seeing us, but the right people are, and they're clearly listening and listening for more than 30 seconds, which counts as a stream. And they're obviously enjoying it. And so that's, that's been really cool. And they kind of rolled out after Spotify opened up the floodgates and said, everyone can submit music to them using that form. It got to the point where there were so many submissions that they were trying to find a way to support all of this great music that they were finding. So they created these personalized editorial playlists in addition to just creating more playlists so that more music could find a home. I love that because I also think I'm assuming that you get more plays too, because they're not refreshing the playlist as often because they don't have to, because they have just a big pool of songs and it's going to be more personalized. I actually didn't know that that was a thing with yeah. the playlist. That's so, I love that. 
Yeah, I love it too. Personalized editorial playlists and it won't have a big, you know, there won't be a big neon sign saying this is personalized. So you just, for some reason, you go, I am really liking this playlist. They seem to know me pretty well. And that could be why. In fact, they do, yes. Yeah, they, they, they know listening. too much. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. And do you feel that um, going after private playlist curators is still a good option for artists? I want to be very careful how I say this because I don't want, it shouldn't be the plan. It shouldn't be, this is our marketing plan. We have a song coming out. We're going to send emails to all of these curators and hope for the best. Um, It should be a very small part of your focus. Uh, You know, I've, Honestly, I've been shocked at the amount of times that people have come to me and they've sent emails out to all of these independent curators, but they haven't even filled out the Spotify submission form itself. And they uploaded the release and decided to set it to go live two days later, which obviously, as we know now, and we continue to preach, you need lead time. People want to hear the song before it's out so that all the work happens before the song comes out. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying don't do that outreach, but that should not be the highest priority by any means. That should be, you've got time, you followed all the other steps, you've done everything else, you've checked all the boxes. Okay. Send some emails out to them as well. And If something happens from that, great. But I wouldn't be banking on that. Um, The other reason for that is it's become a lot more common now. You know, there's books full of contact details Mm. that are being sold. Uh, There's mailing lists. There's uh, a lot of these curators, if their email address is now public somewhere, they are getting overloaded. And for a lot of them, if they're truly independent, uh, they're not necessarily making money doing this. They have a day job. They have other things they do. It used to be fun for them. And now they're getting thousands of emails every day and they feel like they're letting people down. So, <laughs> um, yeah, look, definitely still do it. Just, I, I'd say just be careful and do a little research first. Don't just do a cold blast out to everyone, uh, make it a little more personalized and focused because the amount of times I see uh, friends that curate a playlist that say, you know, I, out of all of the emails I get, maybe 10% are actually relevant to me and the rest are completely different genres. And it's as if these people haven't ever looked at my playlist. Yep. So, um, yeah, and, and that does go a long way. That does get noticed and they will remember you uh, if they see your name continue to pop up in their inbox. So um, just keep that in mind. There is a person on the other end that likes to listen to a certain type of music. Um, and if your music doesn't fit with that, maybe just spare them that email. <laughs> totally, totally agree. So is there any aspect of getting in front of new people that we can actually control as artists. Obviously we can't control whether they choose us for editorial playlists. We can't control if curators, you know, want to add our music. What, what can we control? Or are we kind of just left up to the, the fates? (laughs) Yeah. You know, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, let's, let's assume that you've checked all the boxes. Like we just mentioned, you've submitted the form to Spotify editorial. You've gave them sufficient lead time. Um, you know, there's, there's a few little things that I've included in the book as well. And this is not bait about the book, but um, I just don't remember at the top of my head, but Amazon music have a general email address where you can actually send song pictures right now because they don't have a submission process. Mm. Uh Pandora have a submission form in AMP where you can submit any release as long as it was released within the last 12 months. So it doesn't actually have to be an upcoming release. Um, So some people will put that song out and then they'll go and do that once it's live in Pandora. Uh, Then there's, you know, and the other platforms as well. But beyond that, um, what what else can you do? I I always wonder, can you really influence 
like who the algorithm associates you with. So the, you know, uh, fans also like that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it is a bit of a gray area. They're never going to tell you exactly what contributes to it because obviously people would try and manipulate and game the system. Ruin it by gaming the system. Yeah, because everyone would like to be associated with the biggest artists in that genre. Um, of course, we get that. Um, one thing I have noticed is anytime an artist, either they are a brand new artist or they start a new project under a new name, uh, it seems as though the first 1,000 listeners seem to determine where that artist initially gets placed. I mean, yes, when you fill out these submission forms, you can say this genre, this instrument, this vocal, and plug in all of that information. But it looks as though the first listeners will be the ones that will initially populate that fans also like or related artists. Mm, You know what? That's really interesting. I think that may be true because I've experienced that with my own artist account in that like playlist that I got on a long time ago with my, my Christmas music, people that were on those playlists with me are still in my fans also like. And yeah. Like, Who in the world are these people? <laughs> you know, these other indie artists that I don't know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And it doesn't mean that you are permanently attached to them, but it may take some time for them to change and refresh. Um, so, it, this sounds really weird when you tell someone this, um, but I had a friend recently that makes upbeat dance music and they decided, you know, I, I've been making this really chill lo-fi music that's great for uh, studying and relaxing to. I'm going to tell everyone about it. And I say, no, 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 hear me out. Um, those people that listen to your upbeat dance music all day, every day, Yes, eventually you want them to hear this, this new project, but if they're the first people that listen, all of a sudden you're going to be associated with all of these other artists because Mm -hmm. they're probably listening to dance music and then going and listening to your song and then going back to dance music. Um, So I said, look, you know, just it's going to be a slow grow, but whoever listens first, it's going to be very important that they actually listen to that genre of music mostly. Otherwise, you're going to see some really weird results. And surely enough, they they followed that and they got placed alongside artists that are actually a good fit. Um, so how did they do that? They just didn't tell their current fans about it, and they just yeah. <laughs> as as weird as that sounds, you know, like um, I you know I just said, look, this is going to sound really weird, but it's your first song, brand new project. I you know. For now, I wouldn't tell them. Let's let it sit for a little bit first. Let it let let it find its home, find the right audience, and then, of course, go and tell them. Um, and that works. That worked were well. Were they using a different artist pro- or name for their? Oh work? yeah, it was a com- you know it was treated as a completely new artist. Got it. Okay. So, yeah, it's it's a really weird advice, and not everyone likes it. And I just say, look, you know, I'm I'm not here to. To make you happy i'm here to help you um, well, it's possible advice is different for streaming versus other yeah. things like i would ne- never tell or i always try to tell them keep as much of you can as you can under one artist name or it's going to become yeah. a, a, a nightmare for you to manage if you're going to have all these social media accounts and you know for different projects but what you just said makes sense totally for streaming yeah, yeah and look you know just to add to that there was a friend who started a children's music project and obviously children's music is completely different. Everything, the way it's distributed, um, the ears it will reach, but on Pandora specifically, um, they have children's is a type of artist the same way that uh, hip hop or pop or country. Um, But then they also have holiday um where they basically they'll have the artist and then they will create a brand new profile for that artist where all of their holiday music goes under that Uh, so if you release a christmas album it won't be pushing that christmas album to people that like your other music and it won't be pushing it to them all year round um you know or hanukkah or any any other holiday for that matter so it's it's really interesting seeing that and what Pandora have also done um, to try and deliver the right music to people is they will actually go and let's say 
let's say you release a pop album and then you go ahead and release a country album, you would actually, you could have two different artist profiles um, so that, you know, you've got your country music fans that like you um, getting that de- delivered to them. And then you've got your pop music fans that like you getting that music delivered. It's, it's pretty wild. Um, but it's, it's one of the things about Pandora where I feel like, they've been around a long time and they have so many different pieces of information that are attached to a song that they're really good at um, giving you just this continuous feed of music that feels similar to the previous song works well, and you don't get anything sort of really, um, really far off from, (laughs) you know, whereas with the other platforms, sometimes it will go, you like this artist, you might like this artist. Oh, by the way, they did something completely different 10 years ago and it may shock you, but here it is. Yeah, Um, that's true. No, I think Pandora, I think just the way that it was developed as a platform, it's more about mood and genre than it actually is about the artists. Yeah, you know I mean, it's like it's them all fitting together and making sense because I feel like when Plan Pandora first came out, everybody used it as like music in the dentist's office, and yeah. you know, like you wouldn't want like suddenly some like techno song to come on when you were listening to, uh, you know, you were listening to adult contemporary or something. And so, to exactly. them, the most important thing is that you keep the mood level. <laughs> And exactly. And Pandora sense. at first was just radio. I mean, it was somewhat interactive. You could skip the song if you didn't like it or say thumbs down um, and it would learn as well. And then they grew from that to they have their premium offering now where you can listen to any song on demand. They have playlists in addition to the stations. So um, the people that have been using Pandora for years, still get their 24 hour feed of music that just keeps going and they fine tune it and they're, they're happy because they don't want to think beyond that. They just go, I want music. I know what I want and I just want Pandora to keep delivering it. Mm-hmm. And then there's the other side now, which is I'm going on here to discover some new music and I'm going to start clicking around and I'm going to look at playlists and things like that. Yeah. But I think the Pandora, when it first came out, the best thing that it was, made for was like the, that radio feature where I could be like, I want to listen to Sarah Bareilles radio. And it would like pick all these people that were similar to her because yeah. they knew I liked her. And I just thought that that was the coolest. That was very innovative back then. Yeah. And that's how a lot of artists got successful on Pandora. And, you know, there's people out there that have over a million monthly listeners on Pandora right now, and they're not getting programmed on big playlists. They're just getting played in high rotation on other artists and track radio stations, and they're getting delivered to the right audience. Wow, that's awesome. Well, you know, I could nerd out about this stuff forever because I love talking (laughs) about, you know, releases and how we can capitalize on it and all that stuff. But what have we not covered that you think people should know that is in the book? Wow. What have or at least covered? that they need to know that by getting the book will, will expose them to this new type of thing that they maybe not have even thought of. Yeah, look, um, there's so many handy little tools out there that will do the work that you don't want to do. And what I mean by that is, uh, let me just throw some out there. That's probably a fun way to do it. Um, Spotify have their their own um, tools that they have outside of Spotify for artists where they have multiple websites. Uh, There's one where you can create flyers, posters, cards, uh, social media posts where you can include um, your Spotify QR code, as we mentioned, or you can celebrate a milestone. So you have 25,000 followers. Spotify creates this little image that you can upload onto social media and you can say, thanks, we now have 25,000 followers. You get added to a playlist. There'll be some artwork you can use. Um, And then they'll have a link with that as well so that you've got a direct link to exactly what it is that you're sharing in that post. And, of course, that's all tracked as well, so you can see how many people filter from that into Spotify. Pandora's voice messages we already touched on. Um, Yeah, I... um, Spotify have Canvas as well, which are up to eight-second short looping videos. Uh, One thing about that is that 
you may create that video or have someone else create it for you. It will play when someone is listening to your music on Spotify on their phone, but you can also share that video directly to an Instagram story and it will link to your song at the top of the story and it will use that video that's been created. Uh, so there's a lot of things where you create one piece of content and you can repurpose it multiple times. Now there's a trend where a lot of these platforms are, I don't want to say copying each other, but they're getting inspiration from each other. So you may find someone to create that eight second looping video for you for Spotify. And then you may end up uploading that same video to Amazon music when they launch something similar. Uh, Apple music are also working on looping visuals as well. Uh, and a number of the other platforms. So my goal is to just, find all of these cool little things that you can use. Uh, like I mentioned, you don't like creating social posts. Here's a direct tool, which will create artwork that you can share immediately. Um, you've created the short video to promote your song. Here's some other places you can upload it so that you can include that cool visual with the song when it plays in these streaming platforms. Yeah. I think to me, that's worth getting the book already just because there's all these things that we don't even know exist. I didn't know that that was available. I didn't know you could get all these like Spotify badges and, you know, those are, those are awesome little tools that we can use as artists that we just don't know are there because for whatever reason, they're not publicized a lot. At least I, it seems like I should have known about them and I didn't. Um, so, you know, you guys get the book because it will help you be able to utilize all these tools that are free to us as artists that we can, you know, really expand our presence and, and not have to work as hard on our own to figure out cool ways to get our fans involved. That's the way I'm thinking about it. Um, I did want to ask one quick question. I don't know sure. if you know the answer to this because I get so many questions about, about uh, distributor platforms, right? Everyone's like, I don't know what distributor to use. And they're like angsty about it. And because, you know, each one has their own kind of strengths or the way that they price and everything. Is there any difference in distributors in the way that you're treated by all of these distribution platforms, or is it pretty much the same? Like do you get access to just as much stuff on CD Baby as you do on DistroKid and TuneCore and Ditto and all those? For the most part, yes, they are very similar. It comes down to, do you like the way that it's laid out for you? But I would also say for anyone, if you are with a distributor and you're looking at another one before you make the change, which isn't that painful if you do want to, but if there's something that's missing, simply ask, um, you know, not to put DistroKid on the spot, but uh, there are some stores that DistroKid can distribute to, but you need to ask them. And they have very good reasons for that. So one of those stores was Touch Tunes, which is under Play Network, which is actually music for in-store. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, background music, some people call it Muzak. Uh, by distributing to them, you're actually saying, I give permission for them to include my songs in programming in any of their customers' venues, whether it's hotels, restaurants, et cetera. And the only way you can do that is by asking DistroKid and opting into it. And then CD Baby, you know, they have their normal uh, offering for an artist that signs up, pays, pays the fee and distributes their music. But then when you get to a certain threshold, I don't know the exact numbers, so I won't say them, but there is... Um, higher level services that artists can apply for where um, they can get preferred playlist pitching and things like that. And it will set, if you search it up, I'm sure that you'd be able to find it easily. They have a public facing website for it, but essentially they're saying once you have X number of monthly listeners, or once you have this many followers, or you've, you've had these kind of, you've hit these targets fill out this quick form and you may be able to work more closely with them on future releases. Mm. Uh, a lot of distributors will have their own little perks that they offer. And then of course there are other ones uh, that instead of saying you get a hundred percent, they will say we will take a percentage, maybe 20, 30%, but we will be working more closely with you. We will assign you someone who is a direct contact and you will be calling or emailing them anytime you need anything relating to your music. 
And it's almost like having a person on your team, like a manager or something, but maybe not, not on that level. So yeah, the distributors, most of them can offer the same. And if they show that they can't just ask them, um, that would be my advice. It's um, yeah. Cause it's, it's pretty competitive out there right now. And if you've got some incredible music, they wouldn't want to lose you if they can just simply help you by getting you that feature that you're looking for that you couldn't find. Mm, that's a good point. Yeah. Ask for what you want. Do your research, look around, see what all the distributors have. And then if the one that you were thinking of doesn't seem to have that ask, maybe they do. Yeah. That's, that's awesome advice. I love that. Oh my gosh. This has been so enlightening. I've learned a bunch during this and I even like, scan through the book. So uh, I <laughs> highly recommend you guys get the book. It is just, it just came out. So how can they get a hold of the book? Yeah. So if anyone's wondering why my voice sounds like it's been dropping out during this, I didn't want to mention it at the start. It's because I've been live streaming and talking and making calls and making sure it's in stores and it's available, but it is out. It is everywhere. Um, you can, if, if you want to just go directly to workhardplaylisthard.com, all of the information will be there on the main page, links to all the different bookstores you can get it from. Uh, but it's available in paperback, hardcover, digital, Kindle, uh, basically however you want to get it. And I know that you mentioned the audio book when we were speaking previously. Because I love audio books. <laughs> yes. And Audiobook is definitely coming. Uh, there's so many reasons why audiobooks are important. Um, and, you know, I've got to give sh a shout out to my wife for this because there was a point where I said, how would an audiobook help people? And she said, well, you know, some people may have a visual impairment where a book is not an option for them, uh, but they still can create music, play instruments and do everything else. And an audio book could be another way to reach them. And, um, you know, I'd never really thought about that before. So I encourage everyone that if you're writing blog posts, if you're writing books, just keep in mind that um, it may be worth just also recording that, make it a podcast episode, make it an audio book, make it accessible for everyone that you possibly can. Um, but yeah, it is out everywhere in, in stores worldwide. And if you go to your bookstore and they don't have it, they can look it up and they can order it and they can probably ship it directly to your house as well. That's awesome. So can they go on online sites as well? Can they go on, you know, the typical online sites to order it? Of course. Yeah. Okay. You know, if we're in the U S Amazon, Barnes and Noble, um, in Australia, Booktopia, Dimex, there's... I can't even think of the last time I went into a bookstore, which I, is not good because I want to support bookstores, but just saying like, you know, just wanted to make sure we could get it online. Uh, yeah. I mean, for me, it was, it's exactly what I preach with music. I tell all people, your music has to be available everywhere because people will get it where they get music or they probably will never get it. They'll never, they'll never discover it. So with the book, it was important that every bookstore possible, I made it available and um, yeah, I went to extremes with this one. I, I've read, purchased my own ISBNs. I've registered myself as the publisher and I've registering it with every library I can and just trying to make it available everywhere humanly possible right now. Wow. That's amazing. Okay. You guys go out and get the book, work hard, play this hard.com, Amazon, wherever you buy books, go grab it. It just came out. And you're going to get so many tools in there that I know are going to help you get in front of new potential fans. So go get it. Thank you so much, Mike, for all of this info and just allowing me to nerd out with all these really like very detailed questions I was asking. Thank you for letting me nerd out as well. It's, it's always fun when we catch up and I'm glad we did this one on the record <laughs> so that everyone else could be part of the fun. Um, totally. But Truly, I appreciate you and everything that you do. Um, and, you know, as, as an artist yourself, the amount of time that you dedicate to helping other artists, uh, it's, um, it's truly inspiring. And um, thank you for all of your contributions and, and all of your time. You are welcome. And thank you for letting me put in a little paragraph in the book. So 
Of course, yes. I, I'm a little I, I meant to mention that earlier, that there's going to be a nice surprise in there for everyone that you may see a very, very familiar name. Thank you, Brie. <laughs> Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.